Thank you, Joe. Well, it's true I am a Canadian, but what Joe didn't mention is that I'm due to become an American this month, being sworn in. But it's, I got to tell you, it's kind of a bittersweet thing. Once you know the date, you'll appreciate it. I'm due to be sworn in on April 15. <laughs> Welcome to America. Here's the bill. Well, anyway, I prepared a speech here. That's a, you know, oh my gosh. Well, I'll, I'm going to wing it. Okay. As Joe mentioned, I'm Canadian. I'm not even a constitutional lawyer, so what am I doing writing about American constitutional law? But again, as Joe mentioned, sometimes you're in better shape looking from abroad. And that's my perspective. Because I think if you want to do law, really especially constitutional law, you, you need a comparative perspective. And so that's hopefully what I bring to it. Now that doesn't explain how I came to write this. Uh, a couple of years back I was finishing up a book on the rule of law or the misrule of law in America. And that was at the time of the gridlock over raising the debt ceiling. And what I, what I was wondering was, look, there's this terrible mess about the rule of law. How do we reverse it? And what I realized is there is a reversibility problem built into the American Constitution. It's called the separation of powers. And it doesn't exist in parliamentary regimes. Right? In a parliamentary regime, if there's a law you don't like, you know what you do? You repeal it. It doesn't work quite that way here. So what happens here instead is you get what looks like a one-way ratchet where bad ideas are legislated and then they're turned into the laws of the Medes and the Persians and you can't get rid of them. So we're stuck with all these laws, Obamacare being the latest. There, there, there was actually a wonderful irony about a year ago or half a year ago when Republicans proposed to uh, repeal Obamacare and some Democrats say, said, what are you proposing to do? This is unconstitutional. It's the law of the land, right? Well, it was the law of the land until President Obama decided that, that he could suspend it. So what happened to me then in the last couple of years is I realized there's this reversibility problem, and there's also a problem of a concentration of power at the very top in the person of the president. And that's dangerous, the latter especially so. And then I looked around a little bit, and I, I looked at these ratings, cross-country ratings of economic freedom put out by Heritage and Cato and the like, and we're dropping like a stone, right? Um, it was number one or two, four or five years back, or five or six years back, number 19 now in Cato. And every country ahead of the United States, or at least every democracy, is parliamentary. Well, I, I looked a bit further. I did you know, some number crunching stuff, and I compared parliamentary regimes with presidential regimes. And what I concluded was presidential regimes are not really good for liberty, right? You know, one has to, at George Mason, one has to do that kind of number crunching. It's, it's a kind of learned Asperger syndrome. You know? It's kind of like William F. Buckley saw, thought there was some supposed to be some obligatory sex in his novels. Well, there are obligatory numbers in anything done in George Mason. The, uh, the figures were, were rather shocking when I did the numbers. What they showed was that presidential regimes are associated with the loss of, of political freedom. And you just cast your eye around the world a little bit, and, and you think of South America, for example, and, and you have to admit there's something to that. But when I did my number crunching, I had South American variables. I was just trying to pick up the difference between parliamentary and presidential. And what I figured out was, although the United States is doing well, it didn't invent a system for export. It didn't create a government system that worked very well when exported to other countries. And if you, if you think about the successful presidential countries um, where there's still democracies, there aren't a lot of them. I mean, America, France, but, but then you start thinking about South America and you realize pretty quickly that there are a lot of presidents for life. And there aren't any prime ministers for life, there are presidents for life. So. There's that danger. Now, one thing that's happened across the first world is a concentration of power at the very top. 
That's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's created by the rise of the regulatory state. Parliament or Congress simply can't legislate in enough detail to cover off all the regs. So that leaves a lot of discretion in the hands of the regulators. Who's going to police the regulators? It's got to be the executive branch. So in every modern system, prime ministers and presidents have amassed powers. As well, the rise of the media has made rock stars out of leaders. And it makes rock stars out of only one leader, really, and that is numero uno, the prime minister or the president. So there are these forces that tend to concentrate power in the, in the, in the head of the government. But there are special reasons why this is particularly troubling in, in a presidential regime. One is um, maybe the, the thing which would seem to you to be least noticeable, least worrisome, but to me seems the most worrisome. And that is the way in which head of government and head of state are united in the same person here. So in other countries, you've got the queen and you've got the prime minister. And you, you, know, you, you, you can revere the queen if you want, but the politicians are figures of fun. And as for jug-eared princesses, well, they don't, they don't pose any particular problem. They say silly things, but they're not, going to, they're not going to indict you, and they're not going to audit you. Right? That's, only, that's something only presidents can do. Um, and there is, moreover, a special cringe-making, sick-making adulation of politicians in this country, which I find really hard to understand. If there's some great event, it calls for a presidential medal. If there's some national tragedy, it calls for a presidential speech. And afterwards, Peggy Noonan daubing her eyes. We'll write about it in the Wall Street Journal. It makes me sick, right? Better is a system where politicians are thought to be buffoons, where you don't revere them as, as being important in any particular way. Uh, even the flip side, where one hates the president, seems to me a part of that, that, that problem. Do you remember the Bush derangement syndrome of 10 years back? And, and there are certainly variants of it under Obama. These are like the feelings of a frustrated lover. We want to admire love indeed the president. And if he's betrayed our love in some way, then we naturally hate him. So those extremes of love and hatred just are to be found elsewhere. These are figures of fun. I mean, you can't take them all that seriously. That has the effect, I think, of clipping the wings of the overambitious. It also produces a different kind of leader. The megalomaniac in every leader is strengthened when you have a president who can hide himself behind a lector. Now, there was this wonderful moment where Obama appeared before the Laksaba in India in 2010, I think, and the, the Indian parliamentarians were amazed. Yeah. You know, he, he had this, this lectern and he didn't take questions and he just read his speech off the lectern. I mean, that, that doesn't work in a parliamentary system. They, 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 they couldn't understand a leader hiding behind the teleprompter. By the way, the cost of that trip, according to the Indian press, was $200 million. The annual budget of the Queen is $60 million. Right? So talk about crown government. Um, the imperious, thin-skinned, even verbally clumsy person who can rise to the top here wouldn't last for a second in, in, in a parliament where, where you have to stand up and take questions about absolutely everything and do it perhaps if you could with a, a certain amount of wit uh, and in two languages in my country of Canada for the moment my country. Um, you get a different kind of leader. I, by the way, I call this Jack Spratt's law. I say that it makes sense to separate head of state and head of government the same way in which the lean meat of power was separated from the fat of ceremony in, 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 in Jack Spratt. So there is that difference. Impeachment, well, it's very easy to get rid of uh, an unpopular prime minister, as Margaret Thatcher discovered. Uh, the impeachment power here more or less guarantees that every president will serve his full term. There's an interesting story here. Do you know how it happened that we got our law about how to impeach? In other words, uh, you require impeachment with a majority in, Kong, in the House and two-thirds of the Senate. 
So that was slipped in by Gouverneur Morris on September 4, 1787. And it, there was so much going on at the time, and everybody wanted to go home, that nobody talked about this. But it turned out to be really, really important. So here's my trivia question. How often has it happened in American history that the president was of one power, a majority of the House of Representatives in the other party, and two-thirds of the Senate in the other party? How often? Answer once, yeah? Zero. No, happened once. Hmm? Was it Nixon? Give me a year. 1800. No, not 1800. 1868. Democrat in the White House, two thirds of the Senate. You know, one of the great things, by the way, about that Lincoln movie, I thought, was the way it went to rehabilitate Thaddeus Stevens. All right? We didn't look like Tommy Lee Jones, but I don't care. I mean, um, that was the cast of the Senate back then, but it's never happened since, right? By the way, you know, what was it before Governor Morris slipped in that supermajority? It was, you know, a majority of the Senate. What was, another trivia question, the vote to convict in the Senate in 1998? It was 50 votes. So if we didn't have that change, you know what would have happened? It would have been 50-50, and it would have been kicked over to Al Gore to cast the casting. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been fun to watch that? <laughs> Knowing what we know about Al Gore, one can only speculate what would have happened. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm kind of an equal opportunity congressionalist. I'd like to impeach them all. I'd like to impeach them for high crimes and misdemeanors and uh, you know, misprison of office and just for the spirit of the thing because I think there's too much power in the presidency. So you've got these, these mechanisms in other countries, which parliamentary countries, which have the effect of drawing down power from the executive to the legislature. And not only do they not really much exist here, but what we witnessed is almost an abdication by Congress. I mean, right, the spending power is a good example. Right? One thing that was clear in Philadelphia and clear in the Constitution is the spending power should vest in Congress. Right? Money bills to originate in the House, Senate can amend, but it's congressional. Do you remember the TARP bailout where the President was given about a trillion dollars to spend however he wanted on his friends? Well, part of that trillion dollars went to the auto bailout. Now, the auto bailout was utterly was not appropriate. The TARP funds were appropriated to bail out financial institutions. Now, we're not talking about GMAC, we're talking about the manufacturers of cars. So $80 million went to, on, was spent on something which Congress didn't appropriate. Do you remember Congress getting upset about that? Because I don't. It just happened, right? And nobody was going to say anything different. So we've moved towards a, the, I guess the kind of government we deserve. We've moved towards the kind of government in which the congressional leaders defer to the president because I guess they figure, you know, we don't want to take the heat and attack a popular president. You know that line about Benjamin Franklin, a republic if you can keep it, ultimately depends on the voters. There's this academic literature about how the voters are ill-informed. Right? Most academics believe that. I would believe it if I didn't know how ill-informed academics are. <laughs> I, I, I put a lot more faith in, in, in ordinary people. And by the way, it's not like it takes a ton of intelligence to cast a, an intelligent vote or a, a ton of learning to cast an intelligent vote. Right? All you need to do is follow a few simple rules. For example, if you want to keep uh, taxes down, vote Republican, unless the Republicans just raise taxes, in which case vote Democratic the next time to teach them the lesson. I mean, it, it doesn't take a really, you, you don't have to read Mitt Romney's, what was it, 57 principles? Remember that? Anybody read them? You know, I, like I did. You did? <laughs> so you were the person, I knew there was one person in America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what would we expect of the American voters? If, if Congress won't step up to the task, 
If the Supreme Court is roughly the creature of the president, and if we would expect that 5-4 allegedly conservative majority to disappear in time, then ultimately it comes down to the voters. Well, what are they like? Well, it's not the America that I saw when I first moved here. There's this Quebec filmmaker, Denis Arcand, who had this incredible movie 10 years back. He was describing the millennials. Are there any self-identified millennials here? Because I'm, I'm, yeah, because you're going to have to forgive me, all right? Okay, don't worry. All right. Uh, he was contrasting the millennials with the boomers. And the idea is the boomers, had, you know, we had a lot of vices. In fact, we had nearly all of them when you get down to it. But we had a certain pattern of culture, you know, acquired over the time. But the new millennials moving in, they didn't have all that. You know what the name of the movie was? It was called The Barbarian Invasions. The idea is every generation of teenagers is a generation of barbarians, civilized, hopefully, over the course of their life. Would we expect that civilization to take place quite so well in a generation where the culture has been captured? seemingly by people who don't hold America in esteem? Not so easily. Not so easily. If you're taught, for example, that the framers were not to be, were not worthy people, but were a group of corrupt people voting their self-interest, as Charles Beard said, or a group of slaveholders uh, whose opinions are not worth, worth much, well then you, you know, you don't, you don't pay that much attention to what they thought about. And then you have, finally, how is, how is a population renewed? Well, by birth and by immigration. One of the things I did in the book was I looked at where people were coming from, and I did a weighted average according to their Freedom House score. Now, in the 50s, the immigrant intake kind of looked like America. That was the idea. So they were coming mostly from countries, 70% from um, Europe, Canada. So they, you know, they had basically first world institutions. Uh, the immigrant intake right now, you know, they may be worthy people. They work hard. They may even add to the economy. But you know what? They didn't come here because they read the Federalist Papers. So if we end up with a voting electorate that's quite happy with a president that amasses power in his office, as perhaps was the case in the countries they left, then should we be surprised to see a further expansion of presidential power, of laws made by diktat, of laws not enforced when the president doesn't like them, of the spending power essentially transferred over to, uh, to the presidency, and the war power, the ability of the president to go to war whenever he wants. So, that conceivably is the future, and on that bright note, let me now take questions. Yeah. Why do you feel that exporting the democratic system to South America doesn't work out so well? That's a hard question. I think what happened was, I did some numbers. I think what happened was the cultural institutions weren't there. The one thing I did is, having looked at all presidential versus all parliamentary. I then looked at America versus all other presidential. And I tried to, you know, I, I tried to figure out this American exceptionalism thing. It's exceptional amongst presidential regimes because it is democratic in spite of its constitution, not because of, but in spite of its constitution. Other countries didn't fare so well; they didn't have the cultural inheritance. When I looked at the variables, a couple of things stood out. America was wealthy, and it had a British heritage. It had the common law tradition. You put those variables in, and you explain the difference. But that didn't help with South America. Yeah? What do you think the chances are of success for this convention of states movement uh, to give more power to Congress? Um, the, the Constitutional Convention of Article 5 slipped into the Constitution by the, the sainted uh, uh, man after whom my university is named, George Mason. There's a lot of talk about that, a lot of chit-chat about that by conservatives talking to each other. 
but I don't know if they talk about it with other people on the other side of the aisle. Right? I mean, it's not the case that in doing constitutional conventions we assemble all the people who listen to Mark Levin. Right? Instead, we'd be dealing with a whole bunch of different people. Now, I, I tried this. I taught a course on the framers, my law school. And the people who took the course were pretty conservative students. <clears throat> at the end of it all, I said, well, okay. I mean, you, you, we, we've looked at all of this, right? We've looked at how it turned out. We, we spent one class on parliamentary institutions. So imagine you could rewrite the Constitution. What would you do? And they were puzzled. I said, well, you know, first of all, let's consider getting rid of the Senate. I mean, they're just a bunch of gas bags. Believe me, you won't miss them. No, we want to keep the Senate. All right. Well, what about the Connecticut Compromise? What about the idea that uh, instead of having two senators from each state, why, why not do it rep by pop? You know, weighted in terms of the population. No, no, we, we, we don't want to go there either. And I went down the list. And, you know, what about electing a president? You know, the framers didn't want an elected president. That was put to them four times, and it was voted down each time. On six votes, they voted for a Congress, for a president appointed by Congress. That won every time, once unanimously. What did we end up with? Did we end up with the current regime? No, that's not what they thought would happen. I mean, first of all, they didn't like democracy, and they thought that the electors would actually have an independent discretion. But more importantly, they slipped something into the Constitution, which nobody, which has not mattered since 1824. And what it is, is the idea that you won't have a president unless he is so chosen by a majority of the electors. And the people in Philadelphia in 1787 thought that would really never happen. In other words, they said, after George Washington, we'll ever have national candidates. We'll have a guy from Massachusetts, and we'll have a guy from Virginia, but they'll know nothing about each other, right? Uh, one delegate said, of, of the affairs of South Carolina, I know as much as I know of Kamchatka, right? They're, they're, the distances were huge. The travel distances were, were painful. Travel was painful. And so they thought you'd never get a majority. Well, what happens then? What happens in the Constitution is the choice gets kicked over to the House voting by state. And that, George Mason said, is going to happen 95% of the time. Later he amended that. Later he said 98. So that would be pretty much what uh, Madison wanted right at the beginning in the Virginia plan, Congress choosing the president. Would we get there with a the Constitutional Convention? I don't think so. I think, you know, if you sit down most ordinary Americans and you give them the choices like I did, get rid of the Senate, whatever. By the way, we'd get rid of a lot of gridlock if we just got rid of Harry Reid, right? So, but people know the present system, and I doubt if they'd really want to depart from it. You know? Um, yeah? Um, speaking of the media making rock stars of uh, presidents, uh, it's come to a point now where I can't. I can't watch cable news anymore because uh, all CNN focuses on is Bridge Gate, Bridge Gate, Bridge Gate. Fox News is Benghazi, Benghazi, Benghazi. It seems both stations are fixed, firmly focused on 2016. And on top of that, when you analyze the voter turnout, um, typically in presidential election years, voter turnout in America has been around 60%, whereas in midterm election years, which are arguably more important, the voter turnout is around 40%. Um, speaking of the comfort... You're, you're exactly right, and you know the answer. You know why. Granted, and, but uh, in, in the book, uh, which, which I couldn't wait to buy, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, uh, do, do you discuss ways that, that we can reverse that, or, or is, it, is it just hopeless at this point? Well, um, not much, but let me refer to the prior point. Have you been reading the stories about how the Dems are worried about all the money going to Hillary in 16? The money's not going to Democratic candidates in the congressionals in this year. Well, ask yourself this, if you were a Democratic donor, why would you put a ton of money in a senatorial race if it really doesn't matter, if all the actions on the executive side were moving towards presidentialized politics, where all the giving, where all the action is going to be on the election of the president, Frankly, does it matter very much what Congress is going to do? 
I mean, it's the, the, the deck is stacked against Congress. What you have here is the one person elected by the nation as a whole versus 435 you know, quarreling people from places you never heard of, led by a Speaker of the House from a place in Ohio you never heard of. It's no contest, right? There's always a centralization of power in the one as opposed to the many. So we're going to see more of that. How do you reverse that, you ask me? I don't know. Um, I'd like to see we're not going to change the, if, if you assume we can't change the Constitution, then you're talking about working within the system. What would that entail? It would entail Congress cleaning up its act. So a start was made when the Tea Party Congress of 2010 decided against having earmarks. Now earmarks are not completely got rid of, I mean they're still around, but, but there's a lot less. That's a good start. The contract with America in 94 was Newt Gingrich's attempt to establish congressional governance. And it was great, right? I mean, a large part of the success, the economic success of the 1990s is attributable to, uh, to, to Gingrich, I think. Uh, and then it slowly, you know, the promised land was in sight and the promised land dissipated, right? You remember the mess of 98 and 99. It, I did suggest one thing, however, as well. I suggested um, referenda, national referenda. See, I, I mentioned the problem of the one against the 435. It's an unequal contest. What if you had a referenda where all of Americans were asked to speak on a central problem, like, like the public debt problem? That might be able to give Congress the legitimacy to stand up to the president. Right now, it doesn't have it, does it? I mean, I refer to the 2011 gridlock over the debt ceiling, but back in January, was it, uh, Congress gave a clear debt ceiling to the president, and that was really the final application of the spending power, right? I mean, the, 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 in, president, in American politics right now, really, Congress does not have a lot of control with respect to spending. It doesn't have the debt ceiling issue. That seems to have gone. And with respect to appropriations, uh, the precedent of the GM bailout means the president is permitted to ignore appropriations. And in the end, there's only so much you can do, right, by tying the hands with appropriations. Yeah? So I'm not as concerned about switching, rearranging the chairs on the uh, tech chairs on Titanic. Because we got our guy in, say, uh, your fellow Canadian, Ted Cruz. <laughs> like uh, wait, wait, is it Prime Minister or President? <laughs> uh, King or whatever. Okay. <laughs> but to, for me, the bigger picture is this whole move towards socialism and that more government, more borrowing, more spending, more yeah. taxes. What are your thoughts on that, aside from whether we have a King doing it, or a legislator, we have 10 Dick Turbans, I mean, what about this rule that we're going to become a socialist society every day there's more government? You know, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I looked at the ratio of public debt to the GDP in various countries. And what I came up with, what I concluded was the separation of powers worked at one point, but when it no longer works, then you're in trouble. So here was the story. In 1920, the levels of public debt to GDP are pretty much the same throughout the first world, including America. The same is true in 1960. By 1990, however, every other first world country, parliamentary, went on a spending explosion, a Keynesian explosion. And America didn't. And you know, the separation of powers and Ronald Reagan had a lot to do with it. Right. Well, here we are now, 2014. You can guess where I'm going. America's played catch up. It's roughly the same as all of the other regimes, you know, all of the other first world countries. But here's a difference. It's a lot easier to ch change course in a parliamentary regime. In Canada, the liberal, the liberal government, the left wing government did it in the 1990s. And it was able to do it. It had, it had a prime, there was no separation of powers issue. So it's easier to reverse in a parliamentary regime, what happens when you're in America and you've got gridlock and you've got a Congress that can't step up to the plate with respect to, for example, the debt ceiling? 
then you get what looks like the one-way ratchet. And the only thing I could come up with, as I say, was uh, get your act together, Congress, as Newt Gingrich tried in '94, and maybe, you know, maybe a national referendum on the issue. But all the other kind of monkeying, all of the other constitutional changes that are proposed, there's only one problem, and that is it's so hard to amend the Constitution. Uh, by the way, I mean, there, there, are, there are other things to worry about. I mean, I mentioned the Supreme Court. Well, um, the Supreme Court is roughly the creature of the president. The membership of the Supreme Court depends on who's lucky enough to be president at a time when a justice is unlucky enough to fall under a bus. All right, so I wouldn't predict that we'll have the same Supreme Court in a couple of years. The other things we didn't mention, we didn't mention the criminal power. I would worry about that. I mean, if, if you want to, if, if the comparison is not United States versus Britain, but the United States versus South America or Russia, whatever, then I'd worry about the, the, the criminal law power. Now, now, there was something that happened in the 2012 campaign. Stephanie Cutter, the assistant campaign manager for Obama, suggested that Romney was a felon. Romney? Well, you know, th there was some possible misfiling under the SEC. That's, you know, it's very easy to do that. Uh, Harvey Silverglade wrote a book called Three Felonies a Day. The idea is we're all felons. It's just a matter of prosecutorial discretion. Right. Well, after Stephanie Cutter mentioned that, a couple of people, notably that village idiot Andrew Sullivan, said, well, yes, he is a felon. But what nobody noticed was our descent into Russian territory. What nobody noticed was our descent into Khodorovsky territory, where the wrong kind of politics is criminalized. Well, if you have a system where the scope of federal criminal law is so broad that you can do whatever you want with it, then, the, you know, I guess the question is why hasn't it yet happened? All right? But it hasn't quite happened yet. It certainly hasn't happened yet because there are some limits as to what will be expected. It's not, they won't come from the media all of whom are monarchists when it comes to Obama. It'll come from the voters, and I spoke about that. Yeah. Uh, I've read somewhere that the House has its own jail. Uh, <laughs> and I've tried to do some research on that. Maybe that's a project for one of your students. Huh? Uh, I've, I've asked members of Daryl, this is staff, and they, they say, no, no, we do not have the power to arrest low Lord but this sort of leadership is for someone has to get tough. Yeah. I mean, she should be in jail or uh, incarcerated until she you know, blows a whistle on who told her what mm -hmm. and when. Uh, we've had Fast really and strong, Furious, we've, we've IRS, had, Benghazi. Yeah, take we've your had really strong congressional or episodes of congressional yeah. leadership, starting with Henry Clay. Uh, I don't necessarily approve of Henry Clay, but he was a charismatic. Sure. Powerful uh, congressional leader. Uh, and the, the Gingrich thing was, was a bit of the same thing, but short circuited by Gingrich's own inability to be organized. Well, um, we have spent a whole hour on it. Does it not uh, possible for the House or the Senate to put somebody in their own jail? I mean, why would they go to jail? I don't know if it ever happened. There is a such a thing as contempt of Congress. Um, I have a hell of a lot of contempt for Congress myself. Uh, but it's just been an empty thread up to now. I don't know. Have, have, has anyone acted on it? Do you know? Does anyone know? Hmm? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Good, that solves that, huh? I, I, yeah, so what they would do is they'd refer it to DOJ for prosecution, and, and we kind of think we know what would happen in the DOJ. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned quite a few things that might be possible. I was wondering if you ever discussed it with your students, and I have not an argument, but many people try to tell me that the United States, there's hope for the future, and we have not gone too far. 
but I feel that we have really crossed the, what would you say, the division line where more people want from the government than actually, uh, you know, make a living and give to the government to support everybody else. But then we have Common Core. Uh, I guess you know well about this, which is now in the process of actually brainwashing the children with progressive liberal way, which is socialism, that was brought from the UN. And this is now in the United States, and if it succeeds, we will have adults that will be completely in line with the progressive and socialism agenda. And we are lost. Weren't we there before? <laughs> we are already, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that it made things worse. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of yeah. federally, federal guidelines of any kind. Well, in this education. And uh, originated in the first place, which was the Waldo government idea in 1992, and originated with the UN Charter in 1945 when Harry Truman signed it. It was progressive in the UN Charter. And it's just an outlaw. Well, you know, here, here's the, the kind of thought experiment. Imagine having a conversation with somebody on the subject of excessive presidential power, and who's going to bite at that? And, and I, I would suspect very few millennials would care about it, and very few immigrants would care about it. And so, you, you know, we, look, the United States has had a wonderful run for 225 years, don't get me wrong. But predicting the future, well, it's always a mugs game. But do we have the basis for saying we're going to coast along and nothing's going to change? I mean, I, I think one's entitled to be skeptical generally about the future. I, you know, I certainly have no idea what will happen in 225 years. I certainly don't fault the framers for predicting everything that happened. But, you know, some of the signs are a little worrisome. You know, the, the adulation in the media of the presidency, uh, a DOJ that seems to be quite politicized right now, uh, a voting electorate that, that, you know, is not strongly concerned about constitutional principles. These, this is all different. This is not the way it was, say, in 1980. Yeah. Not not uh, you know the, the the government of the criminalize normal everyday actions. But my question is, uh, what if uh, China and uh, various other uh, countries were to call in their debts? What is what? I didn't hear that. If China and other countries that we owe money to were all to call in their debts at one time, would that uh, would that possibly lead to a change? Will the Chinese eventually own us? Well, um, I guess if they had owned us, they wouldn't want their investment to go south. I, I, I don't know that they would want to destroy America. I, 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 but I, I confess I can't figure out their foreign policy. It's, it's a mixture of hard-nosed economics with a lot of nationalism. I wouldn't want to predict where that's going to go. I mean, I, I'd like to be optimistic there. Yeah. Any what? <laughs> right spots. <laughs> um, yeah, you'd like to see a return to a realization that there's a problem here. See, what I'd like to do is see a congressional party, maybe a congressional Republican party. <clears throat> In fact, I'd like it to be bipartisan. In other words, I'd like us to realize that there are two kinds of Republicans. There are congressional Republicans and there are presidential Republicans. Now, as Joe mentioned, I had a lot of speakers talking to judges, and, and one of them is Harvey Mansfield, bless his soul. And Harvey would talk about the Federalist Papers. And every time Harvey got to Federalist 70, where they talked about, where Hamilton talked about energy and the executive, I could just see Harvey licking his lips. Harvey was a presidentialist. There are some Republicans like Harvey, for whom it's always 1980 in morning in America, or Scalia, who worked in the Nixon administration, or John Yoo, whom we love for his enemies in the, in the George W. Bush White House. And they want a strong presidency. And that's what I wouldn't want. So I think we need an answer to those kinds of people. I think we need to refocus our energies on restoring uh, basic democratic and constitutional principles, which means reducing the power of the executive. You, of course, was the guy who wrote the torture memoranda, and, uh, and whoever since, you know, it's been consistent and, and defends 
uh, President Obama foreign power. But, uh, I would worry about that. Yeah, back back there. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you, sir. First, as a point of information, the U.S. House of Representatives did vote on June 28, 2012, to hold the Attorney General in criminal contempt for his failure to turn over requested documents for their investigations. Yeah. Ironically, the same day that the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of Obamacare. But my question is, given your rather skeptical view of the future of the Republic, why on earth do you want to take an oath as a U.S. citizen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. See, I'll be a dual, but uh, look, you know, abjuring all my allegiance to foreign potentates, that is not a problem. <laughs> foreign princes, I think they're trying to lowball me. We're still talking. Um, you know, you grew up in Western Canada, and you get a, as I did, you get a different perspective. Uh, if there's a Canadian U.S. hockey game, we see that as intramural. Yeah, too similar. You know, if the, you, you, it, when people in Hollywood want to test movies, they'll run them in Toronto because that is the most representative North American market. Uh, it's, it's, it's not much of an issue. Anyway, it's warmer here, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Speaking of Canada, I think what the Harper uh, uh, government has accomplished economically has been astonishing. And I was wondering if you could comment on how a conservative like Harper wins numerous elections in Canada and, and is able to accomplish everything he has. Well, a couple of things. Firstly, the economic reforms were brought in by uh, our left-wing party in Canada. Uh, Harper is noted primarily for his foreign policy initiatives, uh, which, by the way, cost him a Canada a seat in the Security Council when Canada was punished by the Americans for Canada's support for Israel. Bad move, you know. Uh, and, and Harper is completely unapologetic about that. Fine, take your seat. Um, how does he do it? In the last general election in Canada, the Tories were supported by every single newspaper across Canada, with the exception of one, Toronto, Toronto Star, Toronto Red Star. Um, the atmosphere is completely different. You know that Harper won a clear majority of the immigrant vote. He won 52% of the Jewish vote. Um, you, you can't explain this to Americans because it, it doesn't compute. You know, it, it's, it's the idea that a media that can switch back and forth like that. I see that as a problem of presidential politics. I see that as a problem of one identifying too closely with a politician and not being sufficiently objective and removed from them. That's kind of a curse. Somebody else had their hand up? Yeah. Can you talk about position of power and its role throughout the last 20, 30 years? That's certainly true. But what about FDR? Oh, sure. Um, you just talked about his generational presence with FDR and Harris. There was, uh, there, there, I mean, look, there was a gradual increase in presidential power. Uh, Lincoln. Uh, who said my beau ideal of a statesman is Henry Clay, Lincoln would be memorable as the most noteworthy president of the 19th century, quite apart from the Civil War, immigration reform, land-grant colleges, uh, transcontinental railway. Uh, he was transformative, but, but in the end it was still a very thin kind of government and a thin kind of presidency. Uh, that changed notably with, with FDR, and we came very close to something like pure presidential government in the first hundred days in 1933. I mean, Roosevelt would come up with a law, the Brains Trust would come up with a law, they'd send it to Congress, Congress would pass it, uh, all of that in the first hundred days, and that gave us that alphabet soup of agencies, SEC, and so on. Um, and then we kind of coasted thereafter. I mean, the, the war always expands the state, but from 1950 to well, there, there was just a, a gradual expansion. You know, the, the, it was precisely the liberals who identified, who, who gave us the term the imperial presidency. That was Arthur M. Schlesinger. And Schlesinger was a guy who cut his teeth with the Kennedy administration. 
and then he discovered tyranny with the Nixon administration, and then he, then he discovered virtue with the Carter administration, and then he discovered tyranny with the George W. Bush administration. It's just, they're, they're, they're absolutely great. My favorite was Richard Neustadt, who wrote the classic book on presidential politics. And Neustadt was at one point in the 70s approached by some bright young guy. Um, and, the, and this guy said, well, I just had read your book. My boss made me read it. My, the boss was H.R. Haldeman. The next time that Neustadt read about this guy who was being indicted as part of Watergate. So there were, you know, there were moments, there were worrisome moments with, with people like Nixon, but, but nothing like what we have now. Uh, Clinton used the presidential power largely to escape impeachment. I mean, the, the best study of the impeachment power concludes that there, there would have been impeachment plus renewal, but for the fact that Clinton was able to slow walk the proceedings long enough to make the villain Ken Starr. Right? Um, if the timing is controlled by somebody else, like Parliament, then, it, then it's, it's, it's rather different. And, and in any event, you just have a, an up or down vote of non-confidence. You get rid of a guy. Um, I kind of strayed. Yeah. Jim. Um, I take a back seat to no one on being pessimistic about our future <laughs> in this room, uh, especially after hearing, uh, hearing you, and I know if that comes out wrong. Um, I was listening to a Dennis Prager show uh, podcast just the other day, and there was an author on, I believe he may have even been from uh, George Mason, where he talked about, uh, it was a study, and, he, and the federal courts have turned back as unconstitutional less than 1% of all, if you added up all the laws that are passed by Congress, they've turned away less than 1% of laws as being unconstitutional. The idea that our Congress is batting 90, you know, batting <laughs> 990 for its lifetime is absurd. That it, we can't count on the courts, Obamacare being the most glaring example, to yeah. protect our constitutional liberties. We can't count on the executive to restrain itself from violating our constitutional liberty, and we cannot count on Congress to pass laws that respect our constitutional liberty. So is the system itself, you know, we've come here in 250 years, is it, was it doomed always to fail in that regard? You know, there was this federal judge who I really like, Charlie Bryant, who's now deceased, Eastern District of New York. And Charlie said, I, I like the idea of having appointed federal judges rather than elections because that keeps politics out of it. Boy, they don't get much more cynical than that. Politics are present in Supreme Court decisions, obviously. The famous switch in time at save nine in 1937 or eight. And John Roberts, who, when one met him, anyone who met him saw a careerist all the way through. So you know, I wasn't all that surprised by, by what happened in that case. But, but, but even more than that, the convention is that unless you have a really, really egregious nominee, Senate is going to approve the president's choice for a member of the court. And uh, I mean, I know some examples where that didn't happen, obviously. But what that means is, if you want to figure out where the, pre where the Supreme Court is in five years' time or 10 years' time, you, what you have to ask yourself is who's going to be the president. So if you think it's going to be Democrats all the way down, then you're imagining a very different court. Which, which I would. Yeah. Hi, it's just a note of optimism. Uh, if, <laughs> if, if you look around, uh, I mean, I've been doing this for about 50 years now, conservative, libertarian stuff. Right now, you have an organization that didn't even exist four or five years ago called Students for Liberty. It has 450 yep. chapters with really smart people showing up at their conferences. Uh, producing hundreds of thousands of books, which I've published for them. Uh, you have the Federal Society, you've got well, Henry's uh, you know, judging, judge project's been going on for what, 30 years? Uh, Henry Manny, yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's a long time. Yeah. Uh, you are, are you're, starting with young people, you are building cadres. The same thing happened in the 60s with ISI and the F kids. By the time 1980 rolled around, they were old enough actually to help staff the Reagan administration, and there were some pretty good people. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, in other words, and, and all the good scholarship and the interesting stuff that's going on right now is happening on the right, not the left. Yeah. I mean, the, the left is a, basically, to become a leftist, you memorize things, you don't debate, you don't discuss, 
you don't have to defend your ideas, whereas our people tend to be pretty well, well tough and uh, well educated as a result. Herb, was it Herb Stein who said, just when you think things can't get any worse, they don't? Mm -hmm. There are these self-correcting tendencies. I, I was at a conservative convention in North Carolina last weekend, Shivitas group, and I met this really, really nice mother and son. They bought my book. They were nice. <laughs> uh, and he was homeschooled, and they wanted to talk about what college to go to. And I, you know, they... I mentioned Mason, of course, and they mentioned Patrick Henry, which is a university just for homeschool kids, pretty much. And I said, well, you know, you could do that, I said, although, I said, there is something to be said for mixing it up, you know, for getting into the, the real affray of, of life. You, you go to a, a public university of Texas, Virginia, whatever, there are some really fine ones, uh, Illinois, Michigan. You'll meet a whole bunch of people who won't agree with you, and you're going to toughen up. There's something to be said for that. You know, my daughter, as it happens, went to public school. We put her in private school for a couple of years, up until they suggested she take Ritalin. She didn't need it, but when you want to talk about grades, they say, what about Ritalin? So we put her in the public school, and she, she did very well. You know, you know, ended up, yeah, Joe back there. Okay. <laughs> One is Heartland. No, actually, Obama's uh, declining popularity. The fact that Republicans are within reach of winning back the Senate, I mean, that, that's pretty remarkable. And Paul Ryan's alternative budget, we yeah. actually have in Congress somebody who's putting forward a plan that looks like it's doable and that maybe the public can rally around. But I think that pales compared to the bad news. And I'm just stunned that you're so cavalier about what's happening in the country. We have a president who literally is arresting patriots yep. uh, through the IRS. We've got people in the finance sector, some of you have heard me talk about this, who are afraid to come to this event, who are afraid to put their names on checks or, or op-ed pieces because they said they could be arrested tomorrow. We've got the John Doe investigation up in Wisconsin, Eric O'Keefe. Sure. In the middle of the night, you got armed got armed police officers knocking on doors and confiscating the computers and personal records of people for what? For, for speaking as conservatives and uh, engaging legally in the political process. We have a president who is using global warming to destroy the entire fossil fuel industry, to outlaw exploration of public lands, to, to shut down industry after industry, exporting and manufacturing across the ocean. We've got Common Core, which was mentioned earlier, and this is an unprecedented federal over of public education. How much worse does it have to be before a Canadian finally wakes up and says, hey, this is really bad, you got to do something? That's my well, point. you could have global cooling, that would do it for me. <laughs> you know, coming from northern Canada, let me tell you, global warming, bring it on. <laughs> you know, what I hate is you guys who get in the way. <laughs> Other questions? Answer my question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> How bad does it have to be? I mean, don't you think this is? Well, you know, sub. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what the wrong question is. It's the question Bob Dole asked in '96. Where is the outrage? I mean, that's not where we want to come from. I mean, you know, even though I could give Mark Stein lessons in pessimism. <laughs> Nevertheless, if one's running for office, that's not the kind of message you want. I think the right message is 1980, Morning in America, and the Morning in America is not an expansion of federal programs of one kind or another. Yeah. Well, last <laughs> what? So you're not running for office. <laughs> so what do you say? I mean, we have a president who's destroyed the private insurance sector. Yeah. Very deliberately just to stampede people into national health care. Not only am I not running for office, but I made my one foray as a community organizer over the last couple of months. It was opposing bike lanes, not by, opposing the lycra-clad thugs who want to come up my street. And I was never so surrounded by a group of backstabbing, obnoxious, you know, horrible people. And those were the people on my side.
<laughs> well, I'm not going to go there. That comes up for Google search for you. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm adding, I'm Mr. Addy Bike Lane. Let's give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you, guys. Thanks.